Good morning, everyone. You're very welcome to the first of our Lent series, Journey to the Cross, as we travel with Jesus towards that cross of Good Friday and look towards Easter Sunday. As we join together as Christians, as believers here in Balamina, we look forward to this journey together. You're most welcome to St. Patrick's Balamina as we take this first step in our journey. Let's pray together now. Father, as we think and read of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, we pray that your spirit would rest upon us, that we would hear from you this morning. Speak to our hearts. Build up a spirit within us and amongst us, a spirit of unity and fellowship and friendship. We pray all these things in your son's precious name and by your spirit. Amen. They went to the olive grove called Gethsemane and Jesus said, Sit here while I go and pray. He took Peter, James and John with him and he became deeply troubled and distressed. He told them, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and fell to the ground. He prayed that, if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. He cried out, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned and found the disciples asleep. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray, so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them again and prayed the same prayer as before. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open. And they didn't know what to say. When he returned to them the third time, he said, Go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. But no, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up. Oh. Let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. And immediately, even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the twelve disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the elders. The traitor Judas had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. Then you can take him away under guard. As soon as they arrived, Judas walked up to Jesus. Rabbi, he exclaimed, and gave him the kiss. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. Anyone who knows me well will know that almost anything that happens in a garden is a mystery to me because I am the world's worst gardener. Uh, a fitting place, therefore, to start uh, the first of our Friday Lenten studies as we journey to the cross in a garden setting. And our thoughts today go to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, a great moment uh, on the way to the cross, and a moment uh, that provokes many questions. Uh, we know that the name Gethsemane means oil press, and certainly this is a pressurised moment for Jesus. We see him outpour physically and spiritually in prayer before his Father. And we are provoked to ask the question, why? After all, we have seen him face extraordinary circumstances before with absolutely uh, complete control and calm. The temptations in the wilderness, the storm in the boat, uh, the bickering disciples, the Jewish elite and their traps and arguments, and Jesus uh, hardly bats an eyelid 
in confronting these and more dramas in his ministry? Is he faltering now at the 11th hour? Uh, it's almost easier in this mystery drama in the garden to say what's definitely not happening. Is Jesus seeking to avoid the cross? Is he about to disobey his father? Uh, is he doubting the father's plan? Is he planning to leave humanity without a saviour? Scripture uh, provokes us to answer these suppositions roundly. No, no, no. So what is happening? Uh, what is this cup that Jesus is glimpsing and agonising over? The cup, I believe, of God's holy judgment is in Jesus' heart and uh, provoking this anguished moment of prayer. A glimpse of what he's required to do. A glimpse of the costliness of being sin bearer. That separation from his father. And yet there is a triumphant progression in these prayer times. Not my will but thine be done. Even though he glimpses the worst possible agonies to come, he pushes through and, and he emerges strengthened by God to face what is right about to happen, his arrest and betrayal and abandonment. And we see the disciples off to one side, uh, about a stone's throw away, sound asleep. What an image that is as Jesus wrestles in the garden as he faces that pressure the disciples are sleeping. It's like a sermon within a sermon, a prayer within a prayer, a drama within a drama. I wonder as Lent and Easter come and go in 2021, regardless of the extraordinary background we all face, will essentially the mindset of the world towards what God has done, has done and is doing is to slumber. Will we be wearied by looking at the world rather than awakened and to be spiritually sensitive to what God has done in Jesus and will do in these days? Some thoughts to share with you, uh, some mysteries happening in a garden. Uh, and as I look at the garden around me, the growth or lack of growth is still a mystery to me. But may God bring us deeply into his word and into his hope uh, with thankfulness and humility. God bless you all. Let's pray together now. Father, we pray to you as Christ the Son did in the garden. We pray for all those in pain and all those under pressure this day. We ask that your spirit would rest upon them, bless them and keep them. And we remember before you all those who uh, work for our good. We pray for all key workers, all those who care, provide and protect us in these strange and challenging days. And Lord, we ask that you would go with us as we travel through this season of Lent. Be upon us and within us. Amen. Amen. Thank you for tuning in with us this first Friday in Lent. Do come along and join us next Friday as we take the next step in our journey with Christ towards the cross. And do look out on Facebook uh, for all the information about that coming up next week. We pray God would bless you, keep you and go with you until we meet again. Today I welcome you to Grace Hill Moravian Church for the second reflection on the journey of Jesus to the cross. Last week we listened to the narrative of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane with Canon Mark McConnell and Reverend Emma Carson from St Patrick's Church in Ballymena. I'm Sarah Groves and I'm the minister here at Grace Hill. And this time we're not going to look at one passage in the journey but at a thread that runs right through the journey as a constant theme. 
But before we begin, let us pray. Lord Jesus, we come into your presence conscious of our many failings and also of your great kindness and mercy to us. Forgive us our slipshod ways, our lack of attention to you, the way we can so easily forget others and prioritise our own needs. Help us now to wait on you in these brief moments and journey with you to Jerusalem. Help us to understand what took you to the cross and what held you on the cross. We ask you to unite us with all our brothers and sisters in Christ, in Ballymena and in the surrounding villages, as we look to your cross and beyond it to your resurrection and our hope in you. Amen. The thread of this reflection is betrayal. And you can see it in so many different ways in the final days of Jesus' earthly life. Firstly, and most obviously, is the betrayal of Jesus to the chief priest's guards by Judas. The religious establishment had wanted to get rid of Jesus for some time. He was a thorn in the flesh. He was a challenge to their authority and teaching. We don't understand what finally prompted Judas to take that fatal step to deliver Jesus up to the high priests. There is a hint in the Gospels that money was important to Judas. But perhaps it was that Judas was a revolutionary and Jesus had not turned out to be quite the firebrand popular leader Judas had wanted. Surely after the entry into Jerusalem, there should have been a popular uprising, but there wasn't. So whether it was a political or a financial motive for betrayal, you can take your pick. It still comes down to the same thing. A trusted friend and a follower betraying his master with a kiss. Secondly, there's the betrayal of Jesus by one of his closest friends, the one he called Peter, the rock. Peter, unlike the other disciples, had followed the arresting guards and he had seen where Jesus had been taken. And from a distance, he watched on, feeling that in the dark, he wouldn't be seen. But of course, he was, identified by three different people as one of Jesus' followers. And he went on to deny Jesus three times before he heard a cock crow. <coughs> Just as Jesus had said it would. Such a human act, a betrayal of fear. Then there's the betrayal by the religious authorities because they betrayed their own standards of ethics and morals. They failed to upheld the most important principles of their faith. They were prepared to collaborate with the secular, oppressive, unclean Roman authority to hand an innocent man over to death, just to shore up their own status a total betrayal of faith and of decency. Then there's the Roman betrayal, the absurdity of a trial. Not that the Romans were noted for the legal niceties to those who weren't Roman citizens, but it was a betrayal by an abuse of a legal system and Pilate betrayed his own conscience. He was too weak to do the right thing, a grubby betrayal. Lastly comes the betrayal of the crowd. Oh, they'd been so quick to welcome Jesus into Jerusalem just days before. The cheering, perhaps the hope of revolution. 
But all too soon, the public voice had changed. Perhaps a few subtle opinion formers here and there, doubts being sown in the minds of the crowd. And that's it. Public opinion is swayed. And now it's that same crowd that bays for his blood. All of these betrayals are so ancient and yet at the same time so contemporary and overlapping. Betrayal for financial gain. Betrayal because of disillusionment. Betrayal because you're manoeuvring for power. Betrayal because of fear. Betrayal through the abuse of legislative process. Betrayal because it's expedient. It's the best thing to do in the circumstances. Betrayal through an abuse of authority, whether it's legal authority, governmental authority, or spiritual authority. Betrayal through a refusal to stand up for the innocent. Betrayal when love and friendship are abandoned, swept aside. And betrayal through the easy swaying of public opinion. And there's more. These are not easy things to hear or to contemplate, but they are at the heart of the journey to the cross. This is what God in Christ took on for us. This is part of the burden he bore for us. So let us reflect for a few moments on how betrayal has impacted on our lives and how our betrayals have impacted on other people's lives. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on us. Forgive us our personal betrayals of family and friends and of our faith. Forgive, forgive us, us our sins, sins as we forgive, forgive those who sin against us. Open our eyes to the power and manipulation of public opinion. Help us to see the betrayals made in our name and in our culture. May, May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
I'm Pastor Rick Johnston of Calvary Braid Valley, and I'm bringing today the third segment of our Lenten Reflections on Christ's Journey to the Cross. Now, Lent is an unfamiliar concept to me. I was not raised in a church that follows that tradition, um, and I've never attended a church that observes Lent. So it's, it's different to me, but I have found it a, to be a great blessing as our lives become injected into that day, that awesome day of Christ's suffering that he endured for us. That day began the night before in the Garden of Gethsemane as Mark McConnell and Emma Carson brought to us the reflection on the agony that Christ suffered in the garden there. Sarah Groves, last week brought us a reflection on the betrayals that Christ endured on his way to the trial and the cross eventually. Today, we have Simon's encounter with Jesus on his journey to the cross. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would reveal to us, you would show us, Lord, uh, what you have for us as we look at Simon. Lord, help us to relate to you as relating to this man. And Father, we pray that you would reveal and show yourself more to us as we reflect and think about your journey to the cross. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you know, the four Gospels it takes to tell us the story of Jesus. They all basically are telling the same story. The difference is in the details. And so all of the Gospels tell that after the, uh, after the trial, the unjust trial that Jesus suffered, he was given over to Roman soldiers. Those Roman soldiers treated him horribly. They whipped him. They beat him. They scourged him, lashing his back open with the cat of nine tails whip. They mocked him, ridiculing him, putting a robe on him, kneeling before him and plating together a crown of thorns which they jammed on his head and then beat him over the head on it. So he was bloodied, he was bruised, he was mocked, he was humiliated publicly. And then the Gospel of John tells us simply that 
they took him and he went out to Calvary bearing his cross. Now, the cross we realize isn't the whole cross that he was on. He actually was bearing the cross beam. The cross beam that he would be nailed to. The Romans called this the patibulum. And because of that, that's why I was, I'm out here among these, this wood and, and this uh, logs that was piled up here. It's from a tree that was cut down about a year ago. And I helped stack up these logs and these woods. And I'll tell you, they're heavy. They're rough. They're difficult to handle. They are solid. That patibulum weighed about 30 to 40 pounds. I don't know how anybody could have carried it all the way from Jerusalem town center to the cross at Calvary. But Jesus did. They forced Jesus to carry his cross. And on his way out to Calvary, something happened though. The other three gospels tell us this. In Matthew, it records that as they were, as they were heading toward Calvary, they found a man named Simon, who was of Cyrene. And they compelled him, they forced him to carry Jesus' cross. Now, Cyrene, was, uh, the, where this man was from, is a city that was in North Africa. Today it's be in the country of Libya. It was founded by the Greeks about 600 years before Christ. And it had a very large population of Jews. And so many Jews came to Jerusalem from Cyrene. And this man was one of them. Minding his own business, coming into Jerusalem, all of a sudden he was forced by the Roman soldiers to come and carry this heavy patibulum that Jesus was heading, taking with heading toward the cross. Why did the Roman soldiers do this? Well, was it an act of mercy? Just giving Jesus some relief? No. Don't think so. That's just not the Roman way. They weren't like that. Well, was it an act of expediency? Jesus had been severely treated. He was weakened, uh, weakened and bloodied from all that he had suffered before. And he probably stumbled and fell. And the Romans said, we just want to get this over with. Let's find someone to carry the cross for him. And they looked around and they saw Simon. And they forced the cross onto Simon. There's another reason that may have been uh, why the Romans compelled this man to carry Jesus' cross. They had been mocking Jesus. Jesus was being crucified, uh, condemned as the king of the Jews. They had mocked him in false worship as king before they sent him out. And perhaps they took this man, Simon, in mockery of Jesus, saying, well, if he's a king, we can't let him have the drudgery of bearing his cross. Let's get a servant for him. Because as the king of the Jews, we can't allow this to happen. So it's an act of mockery. But most likely, it was because Jesus was just exhausted, too weak, too... Uh, he just stumbled and had difficulties in carrying the cross. Well, in the book of Luke, it tells us that this Simon was coming in to Jerusalem from the countryside when he was seized by the Roman uh, uh, soldiers and forced to follow Jesus with Jesus' cross. Now this gives an interesting picture. We see Simon coming one direction. He was coming in most likely as a Jew coming into Jerusalem that day to buy a Passover lamb for the Passover feast. 
he was doing his religious duty. And all of a sudden he was interrupted in that duty and forced to carry the cross back outside of town. It's a picture of repentance. He was fought coming one way and changed and went the opposite direction. He was coming in alone. Luke also tells us that there was a large crowd that had followed Jesus from the center of Jerusalem. And in this crowd, it included a lot of women who were weeping and wailing and lamenting over Jesus. Well, Jesus being relieved of the cross, Luke records he was able to interact with these women and speak to them. But this large crowd was following Jesus and this one man was coming in alone. And this man was compelled to pick up Jesus' cross and carry it for him to Calvary's hill. The third of, the, of these synoptic gospels, Mark, tells us more detail that's really telling. It says in Mark that this Simon was the father of Rufus and Alexander. Now, we don't know for sure who Rufus and Alexander were, but one thing is for sure, they were known to the Christian church, and they were known to Mark as he wrote his gospel, which tells us one thing. Simon was changed forever that day. He was forced to follow Jesus with his cross, but he ended up following Jesus for the rest of his life. This was a day that changed Simon forever. It was a day that he changed his heart. It was a day that he changed his life. He was forced to follow Jesus but he chose to stay with him. He was forced to carry the cross of Jesus, but he chose to stay following Jesus and bear his own cross. As Jesus said, unless you take up your cross daily and follow after me, you cannot be my disciple. So. We can see ourselves in Simon. And I hope you see yourself in Simon as having done the same thing that he did that day. That day you can just imagine what he saw, what he experienced. Mm -hmm. He was coming in that day to purchase a lamb for Passover. He saw the Lamb of God slain for our sins, the ultimate Passover Lamb, God's sacrifice, and it changed him. When we see Jesus like this, it changes our lives. And we see ourselves in Simon, choosing to change our direction and to follow Jesus the rest of our lives. And I pray that you have done so too. And let's pray for this now. Lord, it's a wonderful thing to follow you. It's a sacrifice for ourselves to follow you, but in pale, in comparison, Lord, with your sacrifice for us that paid it all. Lord, you are the Lamb of God that was slain to take away our sin. And Lord, we believe you. We trust you. And when we reflect and think of the agonies and the sufferings you undertook for our behalf, we can't help but love you. Lord, we, like Simon, are humbled to heart 
when we look at the cross and we consider the cost. Lord, let this reflection, let this idea remain in our hearts this day and for the rest of our lives. Help us, God, to follow after Jesus. Help us, Lord, to remain with you. We love the Lord. And we, I, I thank you so much for this. Well, hello, and it's lovely to welcome you here to Ballymena Methodist Church for this fourth in a series of six Lenten Reflections. My name is Dave Sweeney, and I'm the minister here. As I say, this is the fourth of six Lenten Reflections, which are being prepared by the Ballymena Ministers Fellowship, uh, and it's entitled Journey to the Cross. So far we've had uh, Canon Mark and Reverend Emma from St. Patrick's, Bishop Sarah from Grace Hill Moravian, and Pastor Rick from Calvary Braid Valley. The reflections have taken us from the Garden of Gethsemane through the various betrayals that Jesus experienced to Simon of Cyrene being forced to carry the cross of Christ on the way to Golgotha. Today, we arrive there, we stop and reflect on what is the single most significant moment in human history, the crucifixion of Jesus. But before we do that, let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, as we prepare to reflect on your crucifixion, we marvel again at the extent of your love and especially the pain you were ready to face so that we might receive life in all its fullness, a pain that goes far beyond anything we can ever imagine or understand. Gracious Lord, for all you willingly endured, we thank you. We remember the pain of body as thorns were twisted into your head, as the lash tore into your body, as you staggered under the weight of the cross, as nails were hammered into your hands and feet, as you writhed in agony, waiting for the blissful release of death. Gracious Lord, for all you willingly endured, we thank you. We remember the pain of mind as you came to terms with the betrayal of Judas, the denial of Peter, the faithlessness of your followers, and the shouts of crucify from those who just days before had welcomed you as their king. Gracious Lord, for all you willingly endured, we thank you. We remember the pain of spirit as you bore the sins of the world on your shoulders, as you experienced that dreadful sense of isolation from the Father, as you felt yourself to be abandoned, left there to face the awfulness of your fate alone. Gracious Lord, for all you willingly endured, we thank you. Lord Jesus Christ, we can never begin to grasp what you went through, nor ever fully appreciate the scale of the suffering you endured. But we know that yours was a love greater than any we can ever show, and a sacrifice more costly than any we can ever offer. Gracious Lord, for all you willingly endured, we thank you. Open our eyes to the wonder of your crucifixion, and help us to respond in the only way we can, with heartfelt gratitude, with joyful praise, and with loving service offered in your name and for your glory. Gracious Lord, for all you willingly endured, we thank you. Amen. I want to take a moment to uh, read for you the story of the crucifixion and the death of Jesus as it's recorded in Mark's Gospel. So it's Mark chapter 15, and we begin to read from verse 21. 
A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his clothes, they cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling for Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. And we end at verse 41. And we thank God for this reading from his word. How does one begin to reflect on what happened to Jesus on that first Good Friday? We could spend time theorizing on the various theologies of the cross or wonder what Jesus achieved for humanity or think about the various atonement theories that have been developed over 2,000 years. However, I want us in these moments to go in a different direction. And that direction is simply this. What is your response to Jesus dying on the cross? Some are sceptical, others are scornful, still others are apathetic. Some, perhaps some of us who have grown up in and around the church, take it for granted, while others are, of course, still amazed and awestruck at Jesus' death. That Jesus died on the cross appears to be the ultimate in failure. His fledgling movement snuffed out after three years. His own religious leaders unable to cope with the challenges of his teaching to their own power and authority. So Jesus is handed over by them to the Roman authorities for Roman justice to be meted out so cruelly. And yet, of course, this apparent failure we know turns into a great victory on the third day when Jesus rose again. 
And we know also that his movement was not snuffed out, but rather was energized and grew rapidly. And 2,000 years later, is still growing and going from strength to strength. The story of Jesus' crucifixion carries huge power right to our own day. There is something about the cross of Christ that draws people into the story in ways that maybe they would struggle to explain or even understand. It might be that you're inspired by one uh, from the, one of the many paintings of the crucifixion. Or maybe it is that you've watched uh, some of the film portrayals of the life of Jesus, and particularly um, thinking of the likes of The Passion of the Christ. I was deeply impacted and moved by, by that movie uh, a few years ago. Still others of us may be deeply affected by music, by perhaps the classical composers such as Bach and Handel. Uh, others yet may be influenced by uh, the hymns that we sing in church. When I survey the wondrous cross would be an example. And many will have in their mind's eye images conjured by their own imagination after reading the gospel accounts of the death of Jesus. There is something about the crucifixion of Jesus that has the power to break the hardest of hearts in ways that no amount of sermonizing or theologizing will. Jean-Marie Lustiger, who was a former Archbishop of Paris, he used to tell the story of three rather wild teenagers, who decided to trick their local priest by going to confession and making up all sorts of wild stories about the things that they'd done and confessing their sins. Two of the boys told their stories and ran off laughing. But the priest wasn't fooled. He knew what was going on. And so he listened to the third boy's stories and when he had finished his confession, he gave him a penance to do. He said to him, go to the far end of the church. And there you will see an image, a statue of Jesus hanging on the cross. And say to that image, you did all that for me and I don't give a damn. And say that three times. boy shrugged his shoulders, thought to himself, oh, this seems an easy enough task. And so he went and he looked at that crucifix, that statue of Christ on the cross. And he said, you did all that for me and I don't give a damn. And he said it a second time. But he wasn't able to say it the third time because he broke down in tears, crying. He was so deeply moved. And he was, in fact, a changed person. Archbishop Lustiger said, The reason I know that story is because I was that young man. There is something about the cross, something about Jesus dying there for us, which stands above all the theological discussions, all the possibilities of how we explain it this way or that way, and it takes hold of us. By all means, study the scriptures. By all means, engage with and wrestle with the theological doctrines of the cross and the atonement and the sacrifice of Christ and what he achieved there. But ultimately, each of us must respond in our hearts for ourselves to the love of God displayed par excellence 
in the death of Jesus on the cross. We must respond for ourselves. My prayer is that each of us will know as we think on the cross, whether it's an image we have from a painting, from music, from film, from our own imagination. As we meditate on what Jesus did for us, that we will know in the depths of our being, in ways beyond understanding or explanation, that Jesus did not just die on the cross, but that he died for us. He died for you and he died for me. And that he loves us. He loves us deeply. May we know that today and every day. Amen.
Welcome from all saints to our Lenten journey to Calvary, to the cross. It is the last in our series with the Balamina Ministers Fellowship leading up to Good Friday. And in the introductory hymn, we ask Jesus himself to lead us to the cross, to lead us to his heart. And it's an inward journey. And that's the inward journey which we are now going to follow now. The inward journey to the heart of Jesus is our theme. The visual from the window in our church focused attention on the gospel scene from St. John, chapter 19, 25 to 27. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his home. So let us set this Calvary scene in context by looking back to the earlier stages of Christ's journey. One unavoidable and distressing Good Friday theme is that Christ suffered. He did not seek out suffering, but he had to endure human cruelty and ingratitude as he opposed injustice and as he explained his heavenly Father's good news of salvation to an unwilling audience. He was actually put to death to bring new life, to complete his mission of overcoming sin and death. And as we go along, we ask ourselves, where do I belong in this drama? Where will the journey take me? So let's reflect by putting ourselves in the picture. And there are different pictures during this journey, and I ask you to imagine yourself at each, at each scene and think, how do I belong? And the first scene that I propose is Jesus before Pilate. And I ask you to imagine yourself before Pilate. It's from Matthew twenty-seven twenty-four. Then Pilate saw he was making no impression that in fact a riot was imminent. So he took some water, washed his hands in front of the crowd, and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. It is your concern. Pilate is making a cowardly judgment. He is frightened of Jesus, and of the Jews, and of Caesar. And the hand washing is the sign of his weakness. His judgment is wrong. Pilate is looking at Jesus uncomfortably because he knows that he is abusing his military power. And in challenging Pilate, Jesus has suffered scourging, the crowning with thorns, and hateful abuse. He did not go looking for conflict, but in opposing evil, he courageously accepted all the consequences. Would Jesus want you and me today to challenge political leaders who claim to give people what they want and are merely serving themselves? Am I to question religious leaders who see ministry as a career rather than the service of God? Will I challenge those who are wasting their talents? The terrible thought occurs, will I respond with courage and join his dearest friends, or will I wash my hands and join his deadliest enemies? Lord, sometimes I have to make judgments. May I do so with real justice and with mercy. Let my motive always be love of God and neighbor rather than self-love even when it costs me. Teach me to judge others as I want you to judge me. The second scene I ask you to imagine 
depicts suffering of a different kind. It shows how hard it is to explain the gospel message, even to people who are well-intentioned and sensitive. And the scene I ask you to imagine is from Luke chapter 23, 27 to 29. It's where the women of Jerusalem mourned for Jesus. Large numbers of people followed him, and women too, who mourned and lamented for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep rather for yourselves and for your children. Those women were kind people who were genuinely sad to see suffering. So why did Jesus ask them not to weep for him? I think it is because he wants them to understand better the gospel message, the gospel truth, that it was necessary that Jesus suffer these things and enter into his glory. His suffering was a mysterious way of completing his Father's work of salvation. And how did that happen? As Isaiah had prophesied, he bore the faults of many while praying for sinners. In his earthly ministry, Jesus, the Son of God, made right what had gone astray. He absorbed sinfulness into his own loving heart. The cruelty, selfishness, and weakness of Pilate and Herod and the chief priests represent humanity at its worst. And as a servant, Jesus takes those burdens on his own shoulders and presents himself as the source of life and forgiveness on offer to all. Even the worst of sinners can be converted, but it will cost. Am I then with those women who listened to Jesus and presumably moved on the way to salvation? Statistically today, during COVID, women have endured disproportionate suffering by finding themselves in danger just for doing their own work. It was not only and is not only a sign of heroism, but it is also a contribution to Christ's work of salvation, if we are to believe what Jesus said to those women. Now we turn to the main scene, the main scene of Good Friday. And it's taken from John's Gospel, chapter 19, 25 to 27. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, this is your son. Then he said to the disciple, This is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. Let's now examine this main scene of Calvary and see where we belong. I discern the same truth. My suffering of whatever sort, from minor inconvenience to real hardship, is never useless, because Jesus can transform suffering into a divine healing process. There is a strange calmness about this Calvary scene of the woman and John and Jesus Jesus had not looked for suffering. He looked for truth and love and mercy. And sadly, he found lies and hatred and cruelty, and therefore he suffers. But he is transforming everything. He absorbs the evil and leads us beyond. Observe what is happening outwardly and interiorly. On Calvary, we look down on a place of horrendous evil that mankind had chosen when they could have chosen God's love. Calvary was no garden of Eden. Death was worship rather than life. We see condemned prisoners. 
and cruel persecutors, people whom God had created to live with him forever, tormenting their prisoners. He saw priests and scholars of the people that God had chosen to bear his name, taking sides with the conquerors who actually oppressed them. There were streams of blood on the ground instead of water. The crucifix tree that stood in the parched earth was an instrument of death. His children chose hatred and cowardice instead of him. Is it all to end in darkness and in despair? The eyes of Jesus turned to those round him with compassion on his face. He saw his disciple, his beloved friend, and he saw Mary, his beloved mother, the woman who was without sin, suffering with him. He saw a new Eve standing at the foot of a dead tree, but not choosing evil. At that moment, he identified them as the truest witnesses to his gospel, and he entrusted them to each other to do his will. They would remind the world of the power of love. Here was a new family who trusted in him and in his word. Calvary marked a new beginning. Mary and John belonged with Jesus. They teach by example the power of family love that is enriched by the love of God. A mother's love and grief for her son had brought Mary to Calvary and gave her courage to stand by the cross in reverence and devotion to see her son die. Faith in God's love helped her persevere in the worst of circumstances. Jesus looked at his mother, addressing her tenderly, Woman, this is your son. He wanted her to take John as her son and form a new family with the disciple whom he especially loved. Love had helped John to overcome the great fear and shock that fell on the disciples in Gethsemane. Jesus found the courage to stand, John found the courage to stand by the cross while Jesus was dying. Jesus turned his eyes to John and gave him responsibility to be a son to Mary. This is your mother, he said. What do we learn from this remarkable scene? We learn the power of the love of God. Jesus thought of others to the very end. He considered them his family. His mission was to die for the salvation of all. Every action was inspired by love. I learn how John, the beloved disciple, and Mary, his beloved mother, followed the call of love with exceptional bravery. They were witnesses to the power of Christ's love. And you and I are called to follow their good example and belong to his family too. So let us pray. We thank God that John, the beloved disciple, called us to belong to the family of Jesus by writing for us a wonderful gospel about the divinity of Jesus, who gave his life for the salvation of the whole world. Mary, his blessed mother, can be a mother to us today. Being part of the family of Jesus makes us adopted children of God. We thank God when we are surprised by joy when families and households volunteer time and resources to give practical assistance to the neediest of our society. Let us pray for the gift of perseverance, for hope in the face of this global disease in our very midst. We thank God for the wonderful example of those who survive injustice and mistreatment and emerge as witnesses to truth and forgiveness. They have modeled their lives in Jesus, who laid down his life for others.
Jesus, you lay down in peace in the cold grave, and then you woke up to your everlasting reign. We, like John and the faithful woman, will watch round you, for all our hope and life depends on you. And when our turn comes to die, good Lord, grant that we may sleep peacefully between death and the general resurrection. Guard us from the enemy and save us. And we look again now at our stained glass window of the scene of Calvary. In his victory over death, Christ reveals himself as the living God. He takes us to himself as children of the Father. He is truly our brother. He asks, do you want to belong to my family? And in the words of the final hymn, we rejoice that he rules in God's heavenly kingdom. In response to his call, we promise to belong to his family, whatever it takes. Well, good morning and welcome everybody as uh, we take another moment to reflect uh, on our journey to the cross uh, with different ministers from Balamina Ministers Fellowship uh, and our Friday morning reflections. I hope that you have been blessed and encouraged as you have journeyed with us. Please do check in next Friday, which will be Good Friday, uh, as we really do an amalgam plus extras of all our reflections. Um, hopefully you will find that uh, Balamina Ministers Fellowship event useful uh, on this second strange Easter during our pandemic where we cannot do all the things that we love to do. Uh, we cannot walk in witness around the town. We cannot come as denominations to do our own events. We pray that this online resource will be a blessing to you as you tune in. Our theme uh, for this reflection that Reverend Emma will be uh, helping us into shortly is the wonderful theme of resurrection. And as we prepare, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer together. Let's pray. Lord, we ask you, word and spirit stir up within us as we seek to see and respond afresh to the wonder of the resurrection event. Uh, too big for eyes and brains and hearts to truly comprehend, but world changing and God affirming word and spirit and the presence of the risen Christ be with us and draw close to us as we take this time approaching Easter to think and reflect. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our scripture base for our reflection uh, this Friday morning is from John's Gospel, chapter 20, reading the first 18 verses. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. 
They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. May God add his blessing to this reading from his holy word. And now over to Emma to lead us in the next sections of our reflection. This is a poem called The Promise of the Empty Tomb by Chloe Axford. The promise of the empty tomb rips the rug from under your feet and says, hold on tight, we're going for a ride into the deep unknown. The promise of the empty tomb says the story doesn't end the way you think it will. Yes, your future is set in stone, but I carved it and it's beautiful. The promise of the empty tomb says you are worth so much more than you think you are. You are to die for, and I did. The promise of the empty tomb drives nails through darkness and says, trust me, I have a plan and it is good. The promise of the empty tomb rolls back the stone, dances on death, and says, why are you crying? Don't you know me? What does the empty tomb symbolize for you? It could mean new life, hope, promise, the promise there is no separation now in Christ. For me, it points to the reality of Christ's bodily resurrection, the fact that death could not hold him, the fact that sin was overcome, the fact that victory over death and the wages of sin is now won in Christ. And the fact is that it shows us that Christ's death on the cross was not the end. That what was promised would come into being. That Christ did live, die and rise again for you and I. Many things in life promise us everything. They promise us the world. But do they ever truly deliver? We can put our faith in, our faith, our time, our hope, our energy and money, fame, career, relationships, clothes, food, drink, homes, fabulous cars. But do these things ever truly live up to our expectations? When the world fails to make good its promises, how are we left? We can be left feeling empty, alone, dread. But at Easter, we can remember and remind ourselves once again that one empty promise did in fact offer everything and did in fact not fail to deliver, didn't fail to deliver. That, that is the promise of the empty tomb. That is the one promise made 
good, the one that we can stand on for all our lives and in our lives in the next life. Jesus promised that in dying he would defeat death and in rising to life again three days later he did in fact give us that gift. He filled his promise, he gave us the gift, the promise of eternal life and that's exactly what he did. He pulled through, he made good on his promise. The empty tomb of Easter powerfully brings home the message of a promise fulfilled. It's the promise of the one who says, the story doesn't end like this. It doesn't end the way you think it does. The promise of the one who has our future, who has carved it and says it is beautiful. It's the promise of the one who sees our worth and knows that worth is worth dying for. Who says we are worth dying for, you and I. It's the promise of the one who, even as nails were driven through his hands, says, trust me, I know the plans I have and they are good. It's the promise of the one who lifts our heads, wipes our te tears and asks us, do you know me now? This is the promise of the one who came, lived, died and rose again for each one. I hand over to Mark to lead us in prayer. Thank you so much, Emma, for that. We continue our reflection responsibly in a moment of prayer. So let's be still and pray together. Dear Father, we thank you that you make all things new. Thank you for the victory and power that is in your name. Thank you that you hold the keys over death. Thank you that by your might, Jesus was raised from the grave, paving the way for us to have new life with you. Thank you that you had a plan. Thank you that you made a way. We praise you for your great strength and we praise you for your lavish love. We praise you that you are conqueror, victor, redeemer, and friend. We praise you that you are deliverer, worthy one, everlasting father, great and awesome God. We confess our need for you, fresh, new, and again. We ask that you renew our hearts, minds, and lives for the days in which we live and for the days we face ahead. We pray for your refreshing within us and around us. Keep your words of truth planted firm within us. Help us to keep focused on what is pure and right. Give us the power to be obedient to your word. And when the enemy reminds us where we have been, hissing his lies and attacks our way, we trust that your voice speaks louder and stronger, reminding us that we are safe with you and that your purposes and plans will not fail. We ask that you will be our defence and rear guard, keeping our way clear, removing the obstacles and covering the pitfalls. Lord, lead us on your level ground. Shine your light in us, through us, over us. May we make a difference in this world for your glory and purposes. Set your way before us. May all your plans succeed. We may reflect your peace and hope to a world that so desperately needs your presence and healing. Thanks be to you, Father, for your indescribable gift. To you be glory and honour on this resurrection day 
and forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, dear friends, thank you for joining us on uh, the second of these short reflections from St. Patrick's. Uh, again, we pray God's blessing upon you and your family. Uh, we pray that these reflections may have sharpened uh, your focus and encouraged your soul as we continue to journey towards the cross. May God grant you a wonderful Holy Week and Easter and beyond. God bless you all. Jesus.